Okay, uh, so uh, yeah, welcome again to this uh, second Oster Belgium meeting. And uh, our first speaker today is uh, Vader Skaf, uh, who um, uh, has finished his PhD at the University of Paris uh, one in uh, France, and is currently a postdoc at the University of Salzburg, as well as Geneva. And he holds a, a, a prestigious Marie Curie Fellowship uh, we are happy uh, to uh, have uh, him presenting today, and uh, his topic is probing theoretical statements uh, with thought experiments. So, Ravat, please begin your talk. Okay, thank you. Um, so that's uh, that's the work that started with my PhD, and now uh, it's being but published uh, this year. So it's uh, it's a big talk. So hopefully I can. How how much time do we have, Valeria? Uh, uh, normally uh, you have up to one hour, including discussion. With uh, as I had this, uh, some practical introductions, so you have a, maybe a bit more. But the presentation itself in the first instance uh, should be around half an hour or forty minutes, and then we'll see according to whether the second speaker is ready or not. Okay, good. Okay. So thanks. So uh, hopefully I could fit in as much as I would like to. Uh, some of you have already heard, so hopefully also there's some new stuff uh, in this presentation. Okay, so uh, the, the problem of uh, scientific thought experiment started taking shape with Kuhn's famous question, which was labeled as a paradox, it's a question. So the idea, so how relying exclusively upon familiar data can a thought experiment lead to new knowledge or new understanding of nature? And since we have a proliferation of accounts, and I will add one more today, uh, which is the following very briefly. So a thought experiment uh, I, I defend reveals an inconsistency in part of our previously held theoretical statements. And then the thought experimenter or his, his her critic offers a resolution in the form of a conjecture that merits further investigation. So the thought experiment teaches directly about our theories and then from our theories, we can learn about the world. So compare this to Brown's elaborate taxonomy, have the destructive and the constructive and then the platonic, which are both. So my, my account is in a way destructive and constructive constructive for most thought experiments. Okay, so the plan of the talk is the following. I'll set the stage with a famous uh, case study, the einstein bohr photon box debate and the Solveig's meeting. And then from that, I'll analyze the nature of the inconsistency revealed by thought experiments. And I'll focus on Norton's elimination thesis. I'll criticize the strong reading and several other theses of Norton's. And then I'll pass to the positive uh, part of the talk. I'll provide the common structure of thought experiments. I'll elaborate with three case studies. I think I'll have time to one or two. Uh, my account doesn't... Uh, um, focus on the cognitive process that are employed when we perform the thought experiment, be them propositional or non-propositional. So a thought experiment is a my argument or a mental model or not, it doesn't matter. So the upshot is if I want to provide an systemic account for thought experiment, I have to locate, so I locate the reliability of thought experiment and the replicability and the replicability by the epistemic community, some, something like three experiments. And I'll propose five strategies for the critic in order to show how they assess any given thought experiments. And then I'll conclude. Okay, so let's get started. So famously, Bohr says that in 1929, Solvay conference, Einstein proposed a device indicated in the figure consisting of a box with a clock and the hole inside, and which could be opened and closed by a shutter moved by mean of clockwork within the box. Uh, so the idea is that you let one particle escape, you weigh the box, 
with E equal MC squared, you can have the energy of the particle. Uh, and then you look at the time, you have the time that the particle escaped. From that, you can know both the energy and the time of the particle, which contradicts Heisenberg and Heisenberg principle. And Bohr took it seriously, and he said, after a sleepless night, he came back with a reply, and he said, the argument amounted to a serious challenge and gave rise to a thorough examination of the whole problem. At the outcome of the discussion, it became clear, however, that this argument could not be upheld. In fact, in the consideration of the problem, it was essential to take into account the relationship between the rate of the clock and its position in a gravitational field well known from the redshift formula. Our discussion concentrated on the possible application of an apparatus incorporating Einstein device and drone in figure eight. So this is board 1949 rendering of this survey episode. So what Bohr did, he better described the experimental setup as it's clear from the figure. So the box of which the section is shown in order to exhibit its interior is suspended in a spring balance and is furnished with a pointer to read its position on a scale fixed to the balance support. The weighing of the box may thus be performed with any given accuracy dm by adjusting the balance to its zero position by means of a suitable load of suitable loads. Uh, so on the left here, what you see is the, the mathematical, mathematical derivation of uh, Bohr's reply. But in the thought experiment, what he did is simply that. So the weighing procedure will require the box and the clock to move in a gravitational field. And Bohr says, according to general theory of relativity, a clock, when displaced in the direction of the gravitational force, would change its rate. Which leads him to conclude that the use of the apparatus as a mean of accurately measuring the energy of the photon will prevent us from controlling the moment of its escape. So here we have Einstein presenting a thought experiment, which reveals uh, which which whose which output is in uh, contradicts Heisenberg asserted principle and Bohr came the next day and says no you should uh, you should apply general theory of relativity in order to understand how how you should, how the clock behaves and then the inconsistency uh, vanishes. So how we should analyze this. Uh, so I argue that we should analyze how food experiment reveals an inconsistency, the nature of that inconsistency, and the role of the content of food experiment scenario. For that, I will analyze different pieces, mainly his elimination pieces, and I'll criticize this latter one, partly by drawing on 1973 article by Sheldon Krimsky, where he distinguished between internal and external inconsistencies. But before, so let us look at Norton's argument view. In his first paper, he characterizes the experiment as follows. So they are argument with the posit hypothetical or counterfactual state of affairs, and they invoke particular irrelevant to the generality of the conclusion. So that second point bugged me since the beginning, and I tried to understand it better. And here's what I understood at the end, that it's vague in Norton's uh, proposal. And here's why. Um, so first, Norton tells us that to recover sufficient, so this, this characterization is only necessary, and he says, to recover a sufficient condition for a thought experiment from this characterization, the nature of the particulars in two would have to be specified more closely. They must be of a type sufficient to guarantee the appropriate experimental character to the argument. So what does that mean? Before getting back to this, uh, recently, so in 2018, Brendel identified so five different theses uh, in Norton's uh, uh, view. So we have the identity thesis, so thought experiments are type identical with argument. We have the reconstruction thesis, which tell us that thought experiment can be reconstructed as argument with premises that refer to particulars. We have the reliability thesis, that the epistemic reliability of thought experiment coincides with that of arguments. And you have the elimination thesis, which tell us any conclusion reached by a scientific thought experiment. And we don't see the rest, but I'll come, <laughs> sorry, I'll come back to uh, the elimination thesis more uh, in a bit. And we have the empirical psychological thesis, which tell us that the actual conduct of the thought experiment consists in the, in the execution of, of an argument. So, 
first it's mainly in the so so norton account focuses more on the form not the content so you have the thought experiment which could be reduced to an argument and in order to see if uh, the conclusion is justified well look at the form as it's a justified inference and you don't care about the content and this is very and this is very clear in his not very clear in his elimination thesis is what it tell us and to a lesser extent in the identity thesis this functional role of the content is poorly considered. Uh, so I analyze this. So at the green, that's what I will be doing. So I will analyze this by carefully looking at the nature of the inconsistencies revealed by the experiments. And second, the content is also taken to be represented purely propositionally in Norton's empirical psychological thesis. Remember, this tells you that the actual conduct of the thought experiment is the, is the performance of an argument. And this is criticized heavily in the literature, for example, in the mental model accounts, may not tell us, so according to these accounts, the content of a thought experiment is a mental kind that's not easily reduced to proposition. It is a thought process, a guided contemplation, often with an experiential character in which the thinker manipulates a mental model in a specified way so as to produce a result. So my account will be pluralist concerning this cognitive processes. You could you could you could manipulate proposition. You can emulate, emulate, uh, manipulate uh, a mental model. You could imagine something and then see how it unfolds. So different people will will do different things, and this is irrelevant to my. Account. Okay, so let's get back to this irrelevant particular of Norton. So what does he mean by particular? So. And again, in 1991, he tells us that the presence of these particulars so, uh, is what makes thought experiment experiment like. So thus, in one version of the thought experiment in, when I, in which Einstein thought to demonstrate that the effect of acceleration mimic those of gravitation, so this is Einstein elevated thought experiment, he asked us to imagine a physicist observer who has been drugged and they awakened in the box. So that there is an observer that the observer is a physicist, that the physicist has been drugged, that he is enclosed within a box. All these are particular, which are relevant to the generality of the conclusion, which Einstein seeks to draw. Without particular such as these, however, thought experiment would not have their experimental appearance. So now we can understand better what he means by the elimination thesis. We have to eliminate all these particulars. And it's clear. So this is how he formulates it. Thought experiments are argument which contains particulars irrelevant to the generality of the conclusion. Thus, any conclusion reached by a good thought experiment will also be demonstrable by an argument which does not contain these particulars and therefore is not a thought experiment. So there are two steps here. First, you have the reconstruction thesis that any thought experiment could be reconstructed as an argument. So let us call this a DE argument because it contains premises that refer to particulars. And the second one, we could in principle, so the elimination thesis tells us that we can be able to transform the TE argument into a non-TE argument. That is an argument that does not refer to particulars. There are two readings in the literature so of this elimination thesis. You have the weaker reading that just claims that you can eliminate some details and change other, but still keeping some experimental details. So put differently, this reading is about the product of the thought experiment, the conclusion is general, it's particular free. It's however, not about the process that leads to that conclusion. The stronger reading tells us that even the process is particular free. The, the particular are eliminated in the non-TE argument that should replace the thought experiment. So here are two different places where several places where Norton is arguing for the weaker reading. So, uh, he tells us that the particular might be involved in a counterexample to a universally quantified assertion through which contradiction the conclusion follows. And then in 2014, he says, if all that is required to be experiment, like if the thought experiment describe an imaginary experiment and even traces the execution, then that can be done by an argument. So I take it that some particulars in the imaginary experiments remain here. And then the stronger reading uh, is uh, also defended in 1991. For example, he says, so Einstein black body radiation and to deduct the thought experiment, the conclusion follow from the premises. Thus we could find another argument which is not a thought experiment, but which still take us from premise to the conclusion. And this is he labels the elimination thesis again. 
So the argument may well even be a reductio argument, but not one of an experimental character. But I think it's clear that such an argument, alternative argument would be sufficient to, uh, to uh, difficult to find because, because of the great complexity of some cases at least, maybe many cases. Okay, so what the problem with elimination cases? In order to see that, let us, let's look at Krimsky's two notion of inconsistencies. So the context is popular criticism of Bohr reply to Einstein photon box. So the one that we just saw. So Popper rejects Bohr appeal to a second theory, so general relativity, to save the first theory, quantum mechanics, from the consistency revealed by Einstein photon box. He argued that this amounts to the strange assertion that quantum mechanics contradicts Newton, gener uh, Newton gravitational theory. And for that, Krimsky replies that. No, wait a minute, you have two different inconsistencies here. So in, an internal inconsistency is, a, is when you have a set of theoretical statements, let's say statement from quantum mechanics and Newton gravitational uh, theory, they are internally inconsistent when we can purely, when we have a purely formal or logical inconsistency derived exclusively from the axiomatics of the theory. And then we have external inconsistencies. And here we have a set of theoretical statement is externally inconsistent when it is applied to an experimental arrangement whereupon a statement is implied which is logically inconsistent when one, with one or more statement. So for external inconsistency, you need some particulars, you need some content in order to apply your theories. Uh, and then Krimsky concludes there's nothing peculiar about this remark if we take it the, that the thought experiment reveals an external inconsistency because it's not at all strange that quantum mechanics and Newton gravitational theory be externally inconsistent with respect to some experimental arrangement. But indeed, it's strange if we see it as an internal inconsistency. And this would be the case under the strong reading of the elimination thesis, where the experimental details are eliminated in order to transform the thought experiment into a non PER. And Norton seems to agree with the weaker reading. So in replying to Bishop, and this is, this takes us to the identity thesis a bit. So Bishop criticized Norton on, on, on the grounds of his identity thesis that the einstein thought experiments are type, uh, 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 should, uh, could, could not be identified with the argument. And Norton, so I won't go into the details for lack of time, and Norton replies, so Einstein and Bohr do have two different but similar thought experiments, and they correspond to do a different but similar arguments. We can convert the two thought experiments to one by ignoring the different space times of each. The different space time settings are then responsible for the different outcomes. If that is admissible, then the same strategy works for the arguments. Ignoring premises pertaining to the space time setting, the two argument profile proceed from the same experimental premises. They arrive at different results only because the difference in the premise pertaining to space-time setting. So that is strange. So how does that work? And what is left from the content of the resulting thought, common thought experiment? So is the thought experiment content only about the experimental arrangement? And this is even more perplexing, seeing that the, these details and not the theoretical statement are usually ignored in the elimination thesis. So the way I see things is that you have one, one thought experiment. So to Einstein reveals and consistency and borrow offer a resolution, but more on that later in the, in the account. Uh, it's been what, 15 minutes I'm talking, uh, Valeria? Yeah, it's a bit more, but uh, you can, you have uh, more than half uh, presentation still, half time. Okay. Uh, okay, let's let's look at another example to see to see a bit better this this idea. So here we have Pauli thought experiment that targeted against Bohr uh, theory of the atom. So this is taken from Vickers' uh, book, two thousand thirteen. So first, Pauli considered the hydrogen atom with electric and magnetic external field coming from same direction as in Figure A. So this gave this gave third. This gave certain allowed orbits deciding, decided by given, giving the appropriate values for the quantum numbers n, k, m, and s, and the quantum condition. Then Pauli considered a, an adiabatic change to the system, rotating the electric and magnetic field in opposite direction, as in figure B, 
Uh, follow, and following the rule of the diabetic principle, it turned out that by doing this, a system could be achieved theoretically for which the magnetic quantum number M was equal to zero. But M different zero was stipulated as a necessary feature of the quantum condition. So this is clearly a thought experiment that is aimed at revealing an external inconsistency in quantum, old quantum theory. So Pauli is applying general principle, so the quantum condition and the adiabatic principle, to describe an experimental arrangement, trace its execution, so the hydrogen atom with E and B fields. So the quantum condition allows certain orbit, orbits to the initial system, and then the system is rotated following the rule of the adiabatic principle, and we arrive at M equal to zero. So by doing this, we arrive at a system, a theoretical system with a magnetic quantum number M equal to zero, and this directly interpret, is directly interpreted as contradicting a necessary feature of the quantum condition. So why, why is it external? Because we have hundreds of ways which we might apply electric and magnetic field to a hydrogen atom and then consider a possible adiabatic transformation without having M equal to zero. And to see this, consider other, other attempts to, uh, to reveal an inconsistency in Bohr theory. So for instance, when it's argued at the same time, uh, so at the same period that Pauli saw the experiment, it was argued that the quantum condition that posit only discrete energy level, directly contradicts theoretical statement from classical electrodynamics, for example, which posit a continuity of energy level. So I, I hope you get a sense, this difference between internal and external. So the internal inconsistency is in the second uh, arguments and the internal one in the in Pauli thought experiment. So what about the resolution? Historically, it wasn't followed because Heisberg matrix mechanics and Schrodinger wave mechanics were changing the scientific landscape, and we didn't need to, 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 to provide changes to Bohr or quantum theory. Uh, okay, I'll skip this. So the idea is here that Norden could de defend his stronger reading if we can always be assured that we can transform an internal inconsistency into an internal one and Norton thinks we can, but he doesn't provide any argument for that. So let's take stock for now. So what's, what I've been arguing for is that Norton's strong reading of the elimination thesis could not be, uh, could not be kept. And in fact, Norton argument view comes out stronger with the weaker reading. And I see no reason to eliminate the experimental character of thought experiment that Norton sometimes was alluding to. And even the reliability thesis remained consistent with the weaker reading. It just says that the argument can refer to premises that contain particulars. So granted that some particulars are not eliminable, eliminable, then what are their functions? There are several. One of them to me is most important. So these particulars serve, they provide a way to group and apply theoretical statements, especially when these uh, the, uh, when they come from theories with different scope, let's say thermodynamics and general relativity and quantum mechanics, in order to describe an experimental arrangement, trace its execution and, it, and, and interpret its result. So how to, so how they do this? Uh, no, so we pass to the positive part. Oh, sorry. So how to experiment do this? Uh, well, I, 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 I argue that they, they have this following common structure. So first you have the target question. So scientists identify a target question and use the sort of experiment to answer. For that, he imagines a scenario, unfolds it, arrive at the result, which I'll label the OU, which when interpreted reveals an inconsistency, which then calls for a resolution. So more precisely, the scenario have the following element, you have the theoretical and the empirical statement, be they quantified or not, depending on the progress of the science. Uh, you have experimental arrangement involving objects and things that happen to and are, uh, are performed by them. And you have the description also of the behavior of the theoretically underdescribed part of the experimental arrangement. So some parts are like 
theoretically underdescribed and they remain so in the in the scenario of the thought experiment. So how they behave is provided by the thought experiment and experimenter by the author, and not by some theoretical statement or uh, that 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 uh, describe their behavior. So and then we unfold the scenario. What we do here is we apply the theoretical statement in two A and the description in 2C of the theoretically underdescribed part in order to describe and place the execution of the experimental arrangement in 2D. So some clarifications here. How we apply theoretical statement from 2A to describe and place the execution of the ex imaginary experimental setup is case, subject, and context dependent. So different people uh, will do different things in different cases at different hist uh, historical periods. So as Brendel, as Brendel put it, so there are some posterior acquired truths that function as implicit knowledge, background knowledge, enabling us to come to a relatively quick decision in the evaluation of a thought experiment. And we'll see that this in, 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 in future, in, uh, in the upcoming uh, case studies. But we can always make these premises explicit by reconstructing the thought experiment as an argument. This is useful, for example, when we are skeptical about the plausibility of the thought experiment. So this means that the reliability thesis could remain the ultimate guide without committing us to the strong reading of the elimination thesis, nor to the identity thesis, nor to the empirical psychological thesis. And which brings me to my second thing. So the, the 2C in my structure is meant to, uh, to capture the following. So not every detail of the experimental arrangement is or even could be theoretically or empirically described and based. In these sort of experiments, we seem to go beyond the 2A, 2A or the theoretical description. And this is something that's meant to capture by 2C. 2C says, so consider Maxwell's original demon. You, he says, so also imagine a vessel divided in two with gas inside it. And that the, you have a demon who can see the individual molecules, open and close this hole so as to allow only the fast, swifter molecules to pass from A to B and the slower one from B to A. He will thus, without expenditure of work, contradict the second law of thermodynamics. So the, the, how I understood the debate between Norton and, and uh, let's say the mental model accounts uh, is concerning this, yes, is concerning this uh, empirical psychological thesis. So here are we entertaining a proposition. So imagine, suppose that the demon could measure molecule, molecule speed and manipulate a massless door, or are we more in line with the mental model view when we perform the thought experiment, we really imagine, objectually, imagistically imagine, at least not non-propositionally, a demon, and then we picture in, in our mind now how he behaves, how he detects molecules, and how he opens and closes a massless door, so only has to allow fast molecules to pass to one side and the slow one to the other. And so I claim that neither is important. We could be pluralist, different people could, could unfold the scenario differently. And Cooper uh, in 2005 uh, argues not for the same thing, but in, in this quote she does. So whether to experiment reason through the situation via manipulating a set of proposition or a mental picture makes no difference to my account. So uh, let's get back to so the theoretical question. You have the scenario with the theoretical statement with the experimental arrangement, the description of the theoretically under the right parts, the idealization abstraction, and then you unfold this. You, you follow, you, you run this experiment in your mind being via propositions or mental images or what, what, what. So from that, you arrive at the following. You arrive at an output of the unfolding. That's, that's the result in a way. So if the unfolding of the scenario is correctly done, you arrive at the output, which is a proposition. It's crucial to distinguish the result of such unfolding from the conclusions, so step five and six. So step five is you have an, an inconsistency revealed by interpreting the output and at the end, the thought experiment offer a way out of the inconsistency revealed in the form of a conjecture, a hypothesis that merit further ex to be further explored and, test explored and tested by future theoretical development and empirical confirmation. Uh, 
Okay, I think I said no. So some clarifications to step 46. So the OU is propos propositional and it's analog to an empirically obtained observational statement that constitute the result of some real experiment, let's say. Uh, and it's in conflict with one or more theoretical statement. This is why when you interpret it, you, you get an inconsistency and it calls for a resolution. Uh, but how much uh, time? Uh, yeah. yes. <clears throat> Could you finish in five minutes? In five minutes? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> or or how, how much do you need that we don't have? <laughs> okay, so let me skip the case studies then. Uh, or maybe one. You can return in the discussion if there are questions about this. Okay. Uh, so, so, oh, you so let, want in ten minutes? Uh, okay, let me let me just one uh, uh, analyze one case study and then mm -hmm. jump. Uh, so I'm going. So the photon box. I, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so the photon box thought experiment uh, was was against the. the consistency of, of, uh, of quantum mechanics. Uh, here we have another photon box experiment, which is aimed against the completeness of the theory. So Einstein tell us, so Howard tell us, while he analyzed uh, Einstein, that the complete theory assigns one and only one theoretical state to each real state of a physical system. But in EPR type experiment involving spatial temporally separated by previously interacting systems A and B, quantum mechanics assign different theoretical state, different phi functions to one and the same real state of A. Say, depending upon the, upon the kind of measurement we choose to carry out on B, hence quantum mechanics is incomplete. And Howard said the crucial step here is involve a proof that system A possesses only one and one real state. And this is this should follow from the conjunction of two principles, locality and separability. Separability says that spatial temporally separated object possess well-defined real state. Locality says that such real state is unaffected by events and region separated in state time. Uh, okay, so the thought experiment is the following. You have an experimenter with various measuring instruments, rides on a moving photon box, which later come to rest. Now, as before, a particle escaped through a shutter with a clockwork mechanism. However, now that experimenter will do one of two things. He can either do a precise measurement of the box position and thus a prediction of the exact time when the emitted photon will be received at some distance location S, or he can make a new measurement of the box recoil momentum, in which case he or, he or she can predict exactly the energy of the emitted photon. And how it goes and interpret this uh, scenario as follows. So this is a letter to Epstein. So as soon as it has left the box, the light quantum represents a certain real state of affairs about whose nature we must seek to construct an interpretation, which is naturally and in a certain sense arbitrary. This interpretation depends essentially upon the question, should we assume that the subsequent measurement we made on B physically influenced the fleeing light quantum, that is to say the real state of affair characterized by the light quantum, where that kind of physical effect from B on the fleeing light quantum to occur, it would be an action at a distance that propagates with superluminal velocity. Such an assumption is of course logically possible, but it's so repugnant to my physical instinct that I'm not in a position to take it seriously. Um, so in a different, to put differently, both separability and locality here are used to interpret the fleeting light quantum. Separability associates with it an independent real state of affair from the moment it leaves the box, and locality negates that the subsequent measurement made on the box could physically influence the fleeting light quantum. And then he concludes that quantum mechanics is incomplete. So in my structure, it will be something like the following. So just steps four, five, six. So four, remember, is the output of this unfolding, so the result of the, of the scenario. So we can in principle determine either the exact time or, or the exact energy of the emitted photon depending on the measurement done on the box. However, after the separation of the particle. And this is the, this, this 
reveals an inconsistency for Einstein. So it's, this is logically possible for Einstein, but it's repugnant to his physical instant. That is for quantum mechanics to offer a complete description, either locality or separability, or both should be given out. That is in different terms, the thought experiment bring the light and external inconsistency between locality, separability on the one hand and completeness on another. And then Einstein resolves this inconsistency by saying quantum mechanics is incomplete and we have different resolution in the literature, in the physics literature, which maintains completeness and reject locality separability. Okay, so let me jump very fast. Uh, okay, this just wanted just to show this. So in a different uh, photon box, so you have a simple scenario and then when physicists try to elaborate how the, ex how the experiment should be unfolded, you have like eight equations in order to arrive at, uh, at, the, um, at the output. So this is what, uh, why I'm saying. So different people could unfold the scenario in a different way. It depends how, how, how much they understood the theory, how, the, how much they grasped it and how they can apply it without explicit mathematical derivations. Uh, okay, another case. I, I thought I had one hour, sorry. Uh, so if, I, if, if I'm not going to, to uh, if I want to remain pluralist concerning this different cognitive process and how different people could unfold the scenario differently, uh, then how to experiment are reliable. Well, I say that they are rel the, the reliability of the experiment would, should lie in their replicability by the epistemic community. So I'm a physicist, I have the thought experiment that contradicts uh, quantum mechanics. I put it out and then different people will try to see if really the, 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 the unfolding is correctly done. The, and how do the, so let me jump this, this is on step six. So let's just say that it's conjectural and uh, how you pursue uh, to, to um, uh, resolve a given inconsistency uh, is not linear, but depends on many things. And uh, so, how, so I have the experiment, I put it out, and then it contradicts quantum mechanics, and I say something, let's say. Uh, so the epistemic committee want to assess it. They have different strategies. So the first, is Bohr's strategy. So the theoretical statement in 2A should be different. Here Bohr tells us that it's not quantum mechanics, it's not Newton general relativity that should be used in order to uh, understand how the clocks behave, but general relativity. Remember, this is an imagined experiment and the clock is not in front of us, so we, we cannot see how it behaves. So how, how the dynamics of the clock, let's say, will depend upon our theoretical knowledge. This will this is the thing that will permit us to unfold the scenario. We could also, so the second one would be to reject the behavior that the behavior of some experimental arrangement could remain under described. So the history of Maxwell's demon until today tried to naturalize the demonic process either as a mechanical trapdoor or a computation measure, measuring and erasing device. Uh, However, I should say here that these naturalized thought, naturalized thought experiments are irrele relevant for Maxwell's uh, original demon and its conclusion, but this is a, another story. Maybe that plus demon fits better here. So the third strategy would be to argue that the theoretical statements, not, I, uh, they shouldn't be changed, but they, uh, they are not correctly applied. So it be, so I didn't talk about this. So think about Long Van Twin, for example. Uh, Longva argued that by correctly, by, by uh, correctly applying special relativity, only one of the traveling twin will be younger than his brother. So then it no longer follows. So in all these steps, the OU, the output of the unfolding, no longer follows. You could also reject the idealization. So the Aristotelian could reject the idealizations in Galileo falling body. Uh, Norton analyze, uh, analysis of this version of Maxwell's demon is, uh, uh, falls under this one. And finally, so if you agree to one, two, three, four, and you don't want to accept the conclusion, scientist has also one remaining 
sorry, it should be five strategies. One remaining strategy, so they bite the bullet, they accept that there's an inconsistency. However, they provide a different resolution. Remember, the resolution is only conjectural, so Einstein thought that quantum mechanics is incomplete. Different scientists threw out locality, separability, and tried to do other things. So the paper I defended a new account of thought experiment which characterized them as inconsistency revealers and eliminators. Uh, I provided a common structure and I remained silent concerning the cognitive process that each and every one of us are, are going to, empl to employ in order to unfold a given scenario. Uh, I analyzed the nature of the inconsistency revealed and the conjectural character of its resolution. And the natural question that follows is that do all thought experiments, in, at least in physics, maybe beyond share this analysis? Um, and for that, we should inquire if there is, I think that if the inconsistency revealing step is present in all the thought experiments. And if yes, what does it tell us? And if no, what does it tell us as well? Thank you. Thank you very much, Rabat, uh, for an interesting talk. We are sure that you have a lot to say if anybody has questions, uh, because you have so many material. Uh, Should so, I stop yeah? sharing? Uh, it's up to you. Uh, yeah, uh, well, in principle, you, um, mm, uh, you should be able to uh, to mention in the chat uh, whether you have a question by raising your hand. Uh, and I see that Pierre and uh, Jamier has a question, so please begin. And the others, uh, please raise your hand there, or at worst, uh, write in the chat that you have a question. And in total, we will have uh, 15 to 20 minutes, okay? Uh, so Pierre, uh, please begin. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Hawat, for the talk. Uh, it's also very nice to see you um, Hi, present this. Um, it's just um, a question about the, the, the last step, the resolution of its consistency. Um, it's just a basic observation that usually when you have any consistency, logical inconsistency, there are several ways to resolve the inconsistencies. You can give up several segments. And, um, and here you say that, so I, th I thought that your account, but maybe it's, it's, it's from memory that the first version of your account that I read or what was presented to was you stop at the inconsistency revealer and now you want you have you have this extra step of like resolving the, the inconsistency and i'm curious about what is what is the the element in um, in the thought experiment that drives towards one particular way to resolve the inconsistency is con the inconsistency as opposed to the others and and the second question is are there any ways to do you have any ideas about the reliability of this choice? You mentioned that uh, the resolution is conjectural at the end, but you ha do you have any, uh, any way to evaluate the reliability of this, of this choice? Those uh, are my two questions. I hope they make sense. So no, from, uh, I think from the beginning, I had this uh, resolution step. And okay, good. Uh, I, I don't think the thought experiment could could, could provide any rule that uh, as to what to give up, but it's a pragmatic okay. choice from uh, made by the author. So take uh, pro proto-EPR thought experiment, Einstein wanted to, so prefer to maintain locality and separability because it coheres better with his uh, theoretical beliefs, while uh, the evolution of physics, uh, lots of people tried to, to um, get rid of locality or separability and keep completeness. Uh, so I think what, what's the second question? Yeah, sorry. The second is uh, if there's if there's one possibility that is um, that is selected or like that is made more intuitive by the thought experiment, why, why is it particularly mm. reliable? But if you tell me that the, the thought experiment does not by itself drive uh, you towards one particular way to yeah. the, and perhaps the second question doesn't arise. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, no, no. So the reliability is more focused on the consistency revealing step. Uh, the, okay. resolu the resolution is always conjectural, and uh, you can most of the time you have separate resolution at hand. Uh, and this, okay, so uh, this well, is what I skipped uh, from the presentation. 
of course, I would not like to more, but this is enough for my clarificatory question and there are other questions. So I will, I will leave it there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Howard. It was, it was good to see you. Yeah, you too. It's been a while. Mm. Thank you uh, for this exchange. Uh, does anyone else have a question? Otherwise, I do. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, uh, please write this in the chat or uh, raise your hand. So, uh, what um, first? Uh, well, it happens that uh, I defended the PhD thesis with Alexander Gay uh, on. Um, on the topic of how to match uh, theoretical symmetries with empirical symmetries. And the empirical symmetries are actually, um, um, most of them were or are, still are thought experiments. So it's a question like how to match theoretical symmetries with thought experiments or past, uh, previously, uh, what was previously thought experiment. Uh, so um, two questions on this. Uh, first, I saw you had a couple of slides towards the end about uh, Einstein's elevator, as this is one of the empirical symmetries on, <laughs> according to my topic, I am very curious about what you have to say about this case in particular. So this is first. And uh, second, um, I have another uh, thought well, another empirical symmetry, which is also a thought experiment, uh, where, which is a modification of a double slit experiment. So it uh, uh, observably you have uh, what you have there is, uh, is some equipment and an interference pattern uh, as an outcome of the experiment. But if you place a small uh, man <laughs> inside <laughs> the experiment, then you will see how um, uh, phases of two beams uh, which uh, are passed, which pass through the slits get affected by some some the addition of some device. So there is a a huge difference between the observable side of it and the unobservable side. And the fact that you have a thought experiment is what allows you to put someone in and imagine what this person would see if it was a small person and so on. So uh, is it, is it, you were speaking about I this in your presentation. So there's this crucial difference how um, which which suggests that uh, eliminating the thought exp thought uh, uh, experiment character of this uh, uh, happening uh, is uh, uh, really changes the situation. And you were discussing cases okay, where yeah. it's like uh, uh, you eliminated this is still the same experiment. So I'm I'm uh, it was not your position, but I'm doubtful about this position. So please tell about this and about the uh, Einstein elevator case. Okay, on the second question, I'm the, I, I, so I don't know the thought experiment in order to say more about it, and I didn't really quite understand understand your uh, brief summary of it. Uh, so let, let me let me let me jump to the first one. So so the first one, if I understood correctly, the, you're labeling the equivalence in Einstein elevator the symmetry as a as an as empirical no. Yeah, so it is classified as an empirical symmetry because it could uh, uh, take place in the world. Okay. So this is how I, I understand the thought experiment. So at the time that Einstein thought about the thought experiment, we only had special relativity. Uh, and uh, so he thought, okay, let the guy be at the, an empty space pulled by a demon. Could he tell the difference between uh, gravity and acceleration? So the out, and then you have two 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 observers, so the inside and the outside one, and the inside will tell will say no, I'm in a gravitational uh, field, object behave as if I'm on Earth, and the outside observer will say no, he should be in absolute motion. So why does the outside outside observer says that he's in absolute motion? Because he's relying on special relativity or Newton mechanics in order to analyze uh, the behavior of these objects, let's say. So seeing that this is a thought experiment, the imagined events are traced using our theoretical and empirical knowledge. Um, so 
so that shows Einstein that you have an inconsistency between this observational equivalence between uh, the, the, what the inside observer sees and the theoretical difference that the outside observer is, 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 is uh, applying to the scenario. So how, how can I say this better? Just put it out. I think it's better if, if we hear it from Einstein. So the, the man and the, so the output of this uh, thought experiment would be the following. The man in the chest and the, and the elevator will conclude that he's in a gravitational field. For Einstein, this reveals an inconsistency that uh, this output is inconsistent with Newton mechanics and special relativity, because in these theories, we ought to conclude that the man errs in his conclusion and the only possible description that the man should say in the, the physicist in the lift is that he's an absolute acceleration. And I don't know if this answers your question. I, 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 I went a bit away from, from this, no? No, I don't know. So it looks like you answered the, to the second question by using the first question. So you, uh, you do say that there is a difference between um, what's going on inside, which is observational and the, uh, um, like the theoretical um, explanation of this, which uh, takes into account uh, what goes outside as well. This is how I understood you. No, so the outside observer is relying on special relativity and Newtonian mechanics in order to say that the inside observer should judge that he's an absolute motion. And for Einstein, this, this is uh, absurd because the inside observer could perfectly say that he's in a gravitational field, and this is a very consistent thing to say for I. That shows him that uh, the notion of absolute, uh, the, the notion is of absolute acceleration should be eliminated from our theories. That's the purpose of the thought experiment. And then he resolved this inconsistency by postulating the, the equivalence principle. But I'm not sure if the thought experiment can uh, can force this conclusion. Is it? Is it I think I'm talking more about the the inconsistency revealed, and you want to know more about the resolution step. Maybe, uh, but uh, cannot we? Uh, you are speaking about uh, this objection, which uh, which is made by someone. Um, who is outside the elevator and who is using uh, um, like special relativity and so on. But uh, if, uh, if the resolution is a, as Einstein uh, proposes, then couldn't we also imagine another uh, outside observer who relies on Einstein's theory and who uh, sees uh, the elevator being in, in, the, in the field of some massive body and then uh, the Einstein's uh, explanation still works. So it seems like uh, mm, mm, the objection goes only, um, well, it can come from two sources, either from the theory you use so is it special relativity or general relativity? And secondly, uh, from uh, what you see outside. So these are two unrelated things because if you see that the elevator is actually accelerated by some mechanism, when you see it from outside, then you say it's accelerated. When you see that, in the, is that it is in the field of some massive, in the proximity of some massive body, then you say it's the gravity. So this, is, this could be explained on the basis of the outside of the elevator independently of the theory you use and as I asked this explanation, which is formulated within the elevator, it would still mm -hmm. be correct in one of these cases. Yes, of course. But I thought so. Uh, Einstein explanation just applied to the inside observers. This is why the chest is opaque and the observer inside cannot see the outside, no? Uh, yes, so uh, is the insight is what prompts uh, Einstein's explanation, mm -hmm. and the outside is what adjudicates between the two options. 
but both options are possible outside. So uh, uh, the Einstein's explanation, which was formulated inside, is not ruled out just because we go outside. It can be ruled out occasionally in the cases where the elevator is really accelerated, which you can see from the outside, but it's not ruled in, out in principle because you have uh, these other gravitational cases with some massive uh, body present at the outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what is ruled out? I thought that it was the notion of absolute acceleration that special relativity and Newtonian mechanics would give you. Well, if you if you are at the outside and you see that the elevator is accelerated because there is some mechanism, say it's not an elevator, it's a rocket, and you see some fire going mm -hmm. out from the back, and then you see you say, yeah, it's still accelerated. It's not uh, like it's uh, falling uh, under the influence of the uh, massive bodies uh, field. So, yeah, so but the notion is of absolute. Amazing. Of absolute acceleration. Yeah, maybe maybe absolute is problem. I, I don't know what you mean by absolute. Uh, well, absolute like absolute time, absolute uh, Newtonian absolute acceleration. This is what uh, Einstein was arguing for. So at the end of the thought experiment, he says that the ghost of absolute motion and the absolute acceleration could be spelled as, uh, could be spelled out from physics, something like this. Yeah, but the things like absolute, really absolute acceleration, like absolute time and so on, they are not even unobs they are not even observable. So that's not something you can you would should be able to rule out by just uh, looking outside of anything. Well, Newton thought differently, you know, with the bucket thought experiment. Um, um, yeah, yeah, maybe with the bucket, but with, uh, uh, with I mean, with just uh, this um, special special temporal transformations applied to the whole universe, this is something which does not uh, give any observable result. So uh, this, these are the kinds of cases where uh, whether you have absolute uh, space and time or not, uh, really does not manifest itself in any way. So maybe the bucket case is different, yeah, but uh, this case, if, if, absolute, uh, if absolute acceleration is uh, uh, so uh, in the same way as uh, absolute space and time in these uh, examples of uh, Leibniz and Clark debates, then, uh, then it is not something which you would establish by uh, any observation. Okay. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much. <laughs> very interesting. Uh, so if uh, anyone has a short question, we still have time. Otherwise, we can also uh, move to the second talk. Uh, I, uh, at worst, if you if you uh, if if uh, by the end uh, if towards the end of the meeting you have any questions to uh, to both our speakers or to Avada, you are still welcome to uh, to ask them. Uh, but for now, uh, thank you, Avad, for an interesting talk and the discussion. And uh, now uh, we will move to uh, our second speaker today, uh, which is uh, Quentin Ruyan. Uh, so, Quentin, uh, thank you for being here. You can say something. <laughs> to yes, hello. Talk. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear and uh, I see you very well. Uh, so, sorry okay, uh, being, uh, for beginning at, uh, so early for you. Thank you for being able to join. Uh, so, Kanta is, uh, he made a PhD uh, with a joint um, uh, direction uh, from a person. Uh, at the University of Rennes in France and from Alexander and of Alexander uh, at the CPCs. And uh, now Kenton has just finished a postdoc uh, in Mexico and uh, he will begin uh, this autumn another postdoc, uh, which is also a prestigious Marie Curie uh, uh, funded postdoc uh, at the uh, National at the uh, Complutense University of Madrid. Uh, uh, so um, and uh, now uh, uh, try to share uh, your screen. About, mainly this is about proposing a, a kind of pragmatist uh, methodology for advancing uh, metaphysical debates. Uh, so the, the idea that there are various formulations of quantum mechanics and there are various philosophical interpretations of quantum mechanics. And the aim of the article is to establish relations between the two, between uh, uh, what I call interpret interpretive stance, so it will be a bit more global than a, a full-blown interpretation, but between interpretive stance and uh, formulations and uh, model building choices. Uh, 
and the more precise methodology is uh, to connect uh, to in, to connect different types of modalities, uh, in particular natural, epistemic, and conceptual modalities. So possibilities uh, to different roles that they could play that could play uh, the corresponding theoretical structure in model construction. And so by attributing a different role to this modality, the idea that we could uh, interpret the theory, the structure in, in modal terms. Uh, so I will explain how this work and I will, then I will exam examine two formulations of quantum mechanics, the standard wave function formulation and the consistent histories formulation. And I will associate them with two philosophical stances, interpretive stances, the object, what I call the objectivist and the perspectival stance. So first, let me present some general considerations about uh, the framework, about model building, scientific representation, and so on. So, uh, so it's now usual to consider theories as organized collections of models. Uh, I take a model to be a mathematical structure, at least in physics, a mathematical structure. For example, a state space with dynamical constraints and boundary and initial conditions. And this structure is mapped to a theoretical vocabulary. So basically part of the structure are, uh, have labels uh, which correspond to measurable quantities or dynamical parameters. Uh, and models can be used by scientists to represent concrete or fictional systems. And in the case of concrete targets, this roughly, this roughly involves first recognizing that a model is relevant for the type of target that we want to represent. For example, if we want to represent a, a fluid, we'll have to use a model that uses uh, Navier-Stokes equations. And then taking the structures of the model, interpret the model. That is taking structures, part of the model to denote relevant aspects of the target system. And with this in place, we can use the model to make inferences about the target. Uh, So now this is the general, uh, uh, well, the general presentation of what uh, I take to be a, a model and what representation I take to be a representation of concrete uh, systems. Now let's talk about uh, modalities. So first we can note that the models of a theory are sometimes interpreted as a model structure. So the idea that each model represents a possible world allowed by the theory and then some philosophers have this interpretation and then they say that theoretical laws which are the statements that are true in all models correspond to nomological necessity what is true in all the possible worlds allowed by the theory uh, so assuming the theory is true it would correspond to nomological necessity however uh, I have a, I want to defend a different approach, which I think is more neutral. Uh, uh, because for three reasons. First, because the models can be organized in families corresponding to various types of systems. And so we have, uh, in general, we have a kind of uh, hierarchy rather than a flat set, a flat uh, collection of models. Then models generally represent bounded systems in particular context and not the universe as a whole. So it's an idealization to think that uh, a model would represent a full uh, universe, a full world. Generally they used to represent a system with a particular, particular environmental constraints. And then third models are relatively autonomous from theories. So generally they incorporate uh, ad hoc assumptions that are domain specific. So the three reasons are, are a bit related, but the conclusion is that I think from a pragmatic point of view, we should rather conceive of models as 
conceivable applications of the theory. So it's a conceptual modality. Uh, each model is uh, conceptually possible in the sense that it respects the concepts of the theory, the, the laws and the, so it's, so, and then given a specific target system and a specific purpose, uh, we could say that a subset of all the models of the theory are relevant to represent this system for this purpose. And hopefully that they are accurate. So here we have a practical and an epistemic modality. The idea that we have empirical inputs about the target, we know things about what we want to represent. Uh, we have practical inputs. We are interested in some properties and not others. So some idealizations are acceptable, for example. And then, so this allows us to build a model that is relevant and that represents an epistemic uh, possibility for what the, what the target is like. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, and possibly we could have a more than one model. Uh, we could have, a, in some cases, we could have a, a probabilistic ponderation of a weighting of uh, different possible models. For example, if there is uncertainty on a model parameter, uh, we could reconstruct this as the idea that we have several models, each with its own value for the parameter, and that we don't we're not sure which model is accurate to is the good uh, the right model to represent the target, and then we have a probability distribution on on uh, possible models. So this is the idea of uh, having models as epistemic possibilities. But then to continue with the topic of modality, we can also see that models often have an internal modal structure. So in particular, probabilistic models represent alternative possibilities for a given system. For example, possible outcomes for the system. And this is what allows for causal reasoning, for explanatory reasoning, for counterfactual reasoning. Uh, if we didn't allow the models to have this internal structure, we could not account for this kind of inferences where we, we do counterfactual reason. And so, so this means that there are two distinct levels of modality in representation. You have the one I mentioned uh, before, which is that each model is a possible means of representing a given target, and that only some of them are relevant or accurate representation. So we have conceptual and epistemic possibilities. Each possibility corresponds to one model. And then we have the mod modalities that are inside the models. A model represents various possibilities, for example, possible measurement outcomes. And only some uh, and only some of them are, are relaxed. So yes, and this, well, the the more intuitive interpretation, the more natural interpretation is in terms of natural possibilities. The model represents what is possible, naturally possible for this uh, the target system given natural constraints on phenomena and so on. Here is a, a summary of the of this uh, idea. So you have the, all the models of the theory, which are grouped into families, which are relevant for possible applications. And so each model is an epistemic possibility to represent the target system. And then you have possibilities within models, which are possibilities for the target system. So for example, an electron in a magnetic field must be represented by a model of a given family, which are the models that are relevant, and then can be uncertainty on the exact value for the strength of the magnetic field, which is a question of accuracy, of epistemic possibility. And the, okay, so there's something, okay, the bottom is missing. The resulting modeling assigned probabilities, I oh know, to various 
tr possible trajectories. And these are uh, more naturally interpreted as uh, natural possibilities. So if we accept this picture, we have a kind of criteria for deciding if um, a structure, a theoretical structure corresponds, a structure of possibilities, if it corresponds to epistemic, conceptual, or natural uh, possibilities. The idea that some components are fixed within models, for example, the value of the magnetic field. And these correspond to conditions of relevance or of accuracy, which means that they correspond to epistemic or conceptual, what we could call mind-dependent modalities. The idea that each model has the value, and we might be uncertain about the right value, but uh, the, the value is fixed within the model. So it's, because it's an, uh, so it's a mind independent modality. And then other components are variable, such as possible outcomes, and they correspond to natural contingencies, or represented possibilities, which are relative to the fixed elements. So a few notes about this approach. Uh, so the idea is to associate fixed components, the components that are fixed within models with epistemic modalities, and the components that are variables with natural modalities. Now, I don't take this association to be too strict. I think there's flexibility in uh, the way we can use models to make inferences. And my approach is partly normative. So the idea that uh, represented, when possibilities are represented within model, they naturally induce an interpretation in terms of natural modalities, because typically, uh, the users of the model will make counterfactual inference and talk as if they were talking about real possibilities. And it requires specific qualifications to, to uh, defeat this natural interpretation. We should say, okay, here I represent possibilities, but they're not natural possibilities and so on. So, but the natural interpretation is in terms of natural modalities. So it's partly a normative claim that it's, so for this reason, it's better to follow this norm for philosophical analysis. Having said that, I will show that it corresponds to how models are generally interpreted in science and philosophy. Uh, then uh, another remark is that accepting this, this is not a metaphysical, uh, this is a semantic issue that I'm proposing. It's not a metaphysical issue. And in particular, it does not commit us to natural modalities. It only implies that a model skeptic should use uh, models without internal possibilities. Some, someone who thinks that there are no, no possibilities in the world, a human, for example, well, he could uh, decompose his, if a model has an internal structure, if he could in principle, he or she could in principle decompose the model into more Final structures and and say that these final structures are the real model, are the real representations of what exists in the world, and that their combination in and their probabilistic weighting is just a degree of uh, uncertainty or, or a degree of credence about which model actually represents the world. And this would be a more natural way of doing of doing of presenting things for philosophical analysis. Uh, so, yes, the point is that it doesn't commit us to natural uh, possibility, this way, this way of thinking. So now, the question is, is there a unique way of classifying the components of a theory into fixed and variable categories? So among all the components that are used to build models, such as uh, initial conditions, uh, dynamical parameters, uh, and so on, uh, are they, can we say whether they are fixed or variables within model? Is it always uh, the same? And then can we give this interpretation? Well, first, it can depend on the level of abstraction of the model or on the activity. For example, if we want to make predictions, it's plausible that a scientist who wants to make prediction will fill his model with all the available information. Uh, but a scientific who wants to explain a phenomena might keep initial conditions, variables, in order to do
do counterfactual reasons because explanations often work with a counterfactual reason. Uh, so, so this would mean that there is not an objective fact of the matter as to whether a structure should be interpreted as natural as natural modality or epistemic modality. However, there might be a privileged level of abstraction. That's something that is defended by uh, Geary, who say that there is a, a hierarchy of models which are more or less abstract. And uh, when you go down the, hier the hierarchy, you make things more precise by filling in uh, values and so on. But Geary say that there is a privileged level of abstractions and he based his claim on uh, cognitive, uh, cognitive sciences. Uh, and on research about uh, concepts. Uh, so, so I, I think it makes sense to, to, to claim that there is this uh, basic level of abstraction and that when we make prediction, we're just using a, a model that has this privileged level of abstraction and we use initial conditions to make inferences. So it's a different uh, level. We use the model which, is, uh, which has this privilege level, which might, for example, uh, have several possible initial conditions, but we take an input to make inferences. Anyway, I would argue that even if we accept that, there is some latency over how to build models. And I will take the case of quantum mechanics about which components are fixed within models of variables. And that this deeply affects the structure of the models and their organization in the theory. And that it corresponds to different interpretive stances towards the same theory. So I will take the, the case of quantum, uh, of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Uh, we can consider the following ingredients that are necessary to derive predictions. And I put a typical interpretation uh, on the table. So we need an Hilbert space and an algebra of observables, or maybe a configuration space. But uh, we take the case of the Hilbert space. And generally, this is interpreted as corresponding, is this map to a certain type of systems with certain degrees of freedom. Then we need an Hamiltonian to give the dynamics of the system which is, could be interpreted as a certain physical configuration. Uh, and then we need to specify observables to make predictions, which are generally in, associated with measuring apparatus in a, in a concrete uh, experimental context. Then we need uh, initial conditions that can take the form of a density matrix or a vector. And generally this is interpreted or mapped to a preparation procedure or to a first measurement outcome. So all these ingredients of model buildings could be model in the sense that we could choose uh, one algebra of observable or another. So there is a set of possibilities, there is choice to, to make. We can choose one Hamiltonian or another. We can choose one value for the, some parameters of the Hamiltonian or another. We can choose one observable than, or another to make predictions and so on. These are modal structures, basically. And the question is, then is which ingredients are fixed? So which correspond to the epistemic or conceptual modality? and which ingredients are variables, which correspond to the represented possibilities. So the Hilbert space and the algebra of observables are fixed uh, because they are necessary to build a model. You cannot do anything without, without it. And it's, about, it's a matter of identifying the type of target. It's not a matter of conceiving of possible ways the target could be. And I think it makes sense uh, to claim that the Hamiltonian is fixed as well, because without dynamical constraints, well, the content of the model is not informative. Uh, there's not much to say, except in the case of static systems, but then it's as if they had an implicit dynamic. Uh, and again, it's because it seems to be that the Hamiltonian is about uh, identifying the system and not about 
uh, representing a possibility for the identified system. But then there remain uh, latency of our observables and initial conditions. The question being, should, be, should they be part, should they be fixed within each model? Should each model incorporate an, obse uh, an, an observable or, or initial conditions, or should they be variables? And this is where the objectivist and the perspectivist stance come into uh, the picture. So the objectivist stance can, is the idea that the initial conditions uh, of the system are fixed in a given model. So remember, fixed can mean that we can have epistemic uncertainty about what the initial conditions are. So we can, but this should be interpreted as a probabilistic weighting of possible models, but each possible model has fixed uh, initial conditions. The idea is that they are about uh, that well, the system has is in an in, is in an, in an initial state. Maybe we don't know which, but it is in an initial. So it's part of the, its identity somehow. So it should be represented within models. But the observables could be conceived of as mere contingencies because this specific system could be measured in several possible ways, and it's a contingent matter. It doesn't have to do with a with uh, the identity of the system. It's possible ways the system could be me measured. So if we adopt this uh, view, this, this uh, stance, then it seems that the model represents an observer independent object that can be observed or measured in various ways. And it can be associated with an intuitive idea that, that uh, we often find in uh, philosophy of science that uh, perspective independence is a guide to ontology. This kind of, the idea that uh, variation, the, what remains uh, when we change observables, in this case, uh, when we change what is measured, there's something that remains a uh, constant and it would be a guide to what exists, what really exists. Uh, okay, I will first, uh, I will change the order of my slide. I will now present the perspective stance, which will be the idea that uh, observables are fixed in a model. So that it means that if we, different observables correspond to different targets or different contexts, different things being represented. But initial conditions are contingencies. They are natural contingencies. They are what possibilities for the same uh, system, the same target system. So if we adopt this stance, it seems that a model no more represents uh, an object that exists autonomously, but rather a perspective on the world associated with uh, something being measured. And that can, this perspective can give rise to various out, possible outcomes and also possible initial conditions and all are represented as natural possibilities. So the intuitive idea that we have a functional model of some kind that maps uh, initial conditions and outcomes, possible initial conditions, possible outcomes. And that the object is no more identified by its intrinsic properties, such as its initial state, but rather relative to the observer or to the environment that measures the system. Uh, now, these two stances so correspond to different choices of what should be fixed in models and what should be variable. And I will show that it corresponds exactly to, to two formulations of quantum mechanics. The first one is the standard textbook formulation. And the second one is a consistent histories approach. And Furthermore, the way these formulations are generally interpreted in the literature confirms the, my approach, the, the idea of associating uh, uh, variable parts with natural modalities and uh, 
fixed path with epistemic uh, modalities because uh, precisely because the consistency stories formulation is generally interpret interpreted as a perspective uh, in terms of perspectives. And uh, whereas the, uh, the standard textbook formulation is generally interpreted in terms of uh, objective states existing in the world. So you have around 10 minutes to finish, okay? Okay. Uh, so just to explain a bit, in the standard textbooks, quantum mechanics, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, a model is built by applying a law of evolution using an Hamiltonian, uh, applying the Hamiltonian to Schrodinger's equation to an initial state. So we take an initial state, we apply the law of evolution, and then we have a state for the system at any possible, any given time, which evolves continuously in time. Uh, then measurement outcomes for a given observable are determined probabilistically by the wave function. So what we have here is that initial conditions are fixed because we need them to, to derive the whole wave function. And all possible observable, observables are compatible with the same wave functions. So what is measured on the system corresponds to external contingencies. And what naturally comes out of this stance, so the, what is interesting is that by adopting stance, there are natural ontological choices that come out. In this case, we have a natural ontology of states evolving with time according to deterministic laws. So the, this is because we need a state at every instant in time because we don't know when the system will be measured because precisely because me uh, measurements observables are contingencies. And this corresponds to the objective steps. Then the consistency stories approach. So what is the idea? Uh, well, uh, history is a sequence of projectors in Hilbert space. Roughly speaking, it corresponds to an event instantiating a, a property for the system at a given, at a precise time. And it's possibly a coarse grained property. It doesn't need to be a perfectly fine grained property. So this is an history and a framework what uh, what is called a framework is a set of possible histories for the system. So the idea is that before building a model, we should consider a set of possible histories. And this set must respect these conditions. All histories must be orthogonal. So roughly, uh, yeah, it's a tensor product of projectors to, be, to go a bit in technicalities and all this, these tensor products may be orthogonal, which roughly means that the histories are mutually exclusive, but they sum to unity, which means that at least exactly one of them must be realized by the system. And furthermore, they satisfy consistency conditions, which depends on the dynamics of the system, of the Hamiltonian. These consistency conditions are an important aspect of the consistent histories framework. They, they ensure that the normal probabilities, uh, probability calculus can be applied. So this is the way of avoiding all the weirdness of quantum mechanics. Framework, which it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it can be associated with the notion of decoherence. Uh, well, the consistent histories approach was uh, actually will play an important part for the development of the notion of decoherence in quantum mechanics, which is now uh, central in quantum mechanics. And so it's associated with these consistency conditions. So the framework is what we need to build a model. We need to specify what history among a set of uh, mutually exclusive histories. Uh, no, we, we need to specify a set of mutually exclusive histories that sum to unity. And then we can build the model using the Hamiltonian. I think it's, uh, yeah, 
it's in the, on the slide uh, after. So given the framework and the Hamiltonian of the system, we can compute conditional pr probabilities between any two projectors or any two events of the, of the framework. So it's similar to transition probabilities in the, it's very similar to the path integral formulation. So it's kind of transition probabilities between events. Uh, and given that the framework satisfies the consistency conditions, we are sure that the model will respect standard probability calculus. And roughly the model could be analyzed as a kind of causal network between events. If we, if we have a, a counterfactual theory of causation, for example, it can straightforwardly be analyzed as a causal network of events. Uh, and okay, and so just to go back to the slide before, we have the one framework rule, which is important. It's the idea that when we do counterfactual reasoning, we should do this within a framework. We cannot do that with uh, outside between. We can not switch frameworks, so, or, or otherwise we will get uh, logical inconsistencies. So the idea is that changing the framework is changing the model, is changing what we're talking about, changing the target system. Now. We can see that this is exactly what I call the perspective stance. Uh, observables are fixed in the model because they correct, they're roughly giving a set of uh, histories. Giving a framework is roughly equivalent to giving a, uh, a finite set of observables at, at uh, distinct uh, times. And the initial state is not given. So the model, the final model of a consistent histories does not give us probabilities for histories. Uh, for this, we need uh, another input such as initial conditions, but they're not given in the model. All we have is transition probabilities between uh, events, but we don't have a specification of which initial event is more probable than the other. So the initial state is not given, it's contingent. And this corresponds to the consistent histories formulation. And uh, what, is, what is interesting that we get a completely different ontology out of this. Uh, like naturally we get an ontology of possible events and causal networks. So here's a summary. The, so the objective stance observables are variable, initial conditions are fixed. And we get an ontology of states and evolution laws, and the identity of systems is intrinsic. The perspective stance observables are fixed, initial conditions are variables, and we get an ontology of events and uh, causal relations, and the identity is relational. The identity of the system is relational because it's relative to what is measured on the system, so to speak. Uh, okay. And then it seem, this seems to correspond to the way this, uh, uh, this formulation of quantum mechanics is generally interpreted. So generally, so Griffiths, who proposed the consistent histories approach, uh, is a physicist who first proposed uh, this approach. He, he assumed the perspectivist uh, stance. So he says uh, that the choice of a framework is a matter of uh, adopting a perspective on system and so on. He, was, he also say that uh, initial conditions and outcomes are contingencies, are natural contingencies. So it corresponds exactly to what the approach I propose would uh, predict. And then scientific realists typically use the standard wave function formulation and they they think of uh, the wave functional representing objective states for systems. There is even a, a theorem that, that proves that the wave function cannot be interpreted as an epistemic entity. Uh, one, maybe one notable exception seems to be the Copenhagen uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics because it's, cast, it, it's expressed in the standard textbook formulation, the wave function formulation. 
but it's not very realistic. It has instrumentalist flavors. However, even in this interpretation, talk, talk of uh, evolving states is pervasive. Furthermore, this formulation seems incomplete because the notion of measurement is left and analyzed. And actually, Griffiths say that the consistent history is nothing but uh, Copenhagen done right. So the, the idea that if really you want to accept the Copenhagen interpretation, you should put the observables uh, in the framework. So you should use them to build your model. So this seems to vindicate uh, the approach, the, the methodology I adopted. And I think just to finish, to conclude, I think that uh, an interest of this methodology of associating uh, interpretive stances with formulations, with model uh, choices, is that maybe we could assess uh, the different interpretive stances on the basis of the fruitfulness of the, of the models that are built using these stances. So it gives us, it might give us tools to assess uh, pragmatic, to, to assess pragmatically which uh, interpretive stance uh, works better. I don't know if I have time to present this. Uh, not very much. Okay. We have 15, uh, have the, the one, one minute. Sorry? One minute too. Okay, I will. Well, so basically, why well, we just say about, I will just put the last slide, slide then. Uh, well, well, just rapidly. So I think that the, the way, the standard wave function Formulation has a lot of problems. So as is well known, uh, the bond rule is external to the model. So its status is unclear. Uh, it's it, well, uh, there are, there's non-locality problem and so on. There is no straightforward ontology. So you have a lot of uh, programs of completing the, the theory with uh, primitive ontologies. And you have problems of causation, so the relation with high level theories is unclear. And the consistent histories is a way of avoiding all these problems. So basically the bond rule is built into the model. So you, the status is clear, probabilities are well behaved. Uh, the causal network is local, it's perfectly local. Correlations are always explained by common causes. And the ontology comes out quite naturally and it's directly associated with our measurements. So there is interpretation is straightforward. And the price to pay is only the relativity to a framework, which is a weird object. But I won't uh, discuss this because it can it will lead us too far. But I think that one way to assess uh, these two stances be, beyond what I've just said is to examine the virtues, the virtues of, uh, of the models produced. And I think that well, explanatory power is generally considered an important aim for science. And it's often analyzed in counterfactual terms. So giving an explanation is giving, for example, or causal terms, giving an explanation is saying, well, if this would not have happened, etc. And it's also often recognized that explanations are contextual. There is a sensitivity to properties of interest. So for example, we can explain a car accident either by referring to the to a problem in the in the engine or to uh, to the arch architecture, the urban architecture of the road, and all explanations are valid depending on what we're interested in, or the driver or whatever. So, and all this makes more sense if we fix observables, observables corresponding to the properties of interest, and if we let initial conditions vary for explanatory purpose. So it seems. I would say that uh, the models of consistent histories are more directly explanatory. They fit better with uh, explanations in science in general. To take the, ex the example of the explanation of the spectrum from uh, the Bohr's model of the atom, well, in general, the observable is implicitly fixed and there is an implicit application of Bohr's rule. 
uh, because we're interested in emitted frequencies. So we're interested in one observable, the energy. We're not interested in position, in the position of the electron in, uh, in the atom. And, but the initial state of the atom is not fixed uh, because it must vary if we want to account for all possible spectral values. And of course, in general, the explanation given in classes is based on wave functions. But uh, this, I would say that maybe this is because what I, the remarks I, I, I gave before that there is a kind of flexibility anyway in, uh, in the use of models. So we can do counterfactual reasoning on initial states, even if they are not fixed uh, in models. So the association I, I propose is not, uh, is not strict because in any case, models are rather flexible. It's more like it has a normative component. The best, the best way to present the models should follow the, the more natural interpretation of the model. And so in this case, I would say that for explanatory purpose, we should maybe, it's normative play, we should, uh, we should use a uh, consistent histories. And here it is. So basically the general idea was to make associations between uh, modeling choices and interpretive stances to other theories by using the role modalities play in the model structure play model construction. And uh, this gives us two main stance, objectivist and perspective stance. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kantar, uh, for a very interesting talk. Uh, uh, and uh, we are happy to have heard it, and uh, we still have some time for questions. Uh, so uh, I see people applauding, but uh, please also I see your hand if you have any question. In the meantime, maybe I can ask one already. Uh, so, uh, Gantar, um, how to, <laughs> uh, how, uh, um, do you have anything to say about other interpretations of quantum mechanics? And do you have anything to say about... Um, Sorry, any words? Hmm? Uh, so so you, you have talked about um, ordinary quantum mechanics and about the consistent history approach, but of course there are also other interpretations of quantum mechanics like yes. uh, and whatever. Uh, so do you have anything to say about these interpretations? And uh, also, uh, there is a Heisenberg picture of quantum mechanics of which I'm not a specialist, but uh, uh, it looks like um, they are observables evolve and wave functions stay fixed, while in Schrodinger mechanics, wave functions evolve and observables stay fixed or something like this. So uh, do you have anything to say about this uh, Heisenberg picture? Uh, okay, so, so basically uh, the article was more framed like, like a the proposal of a methodology rather than a, so the idea was to 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 apply this methodology to a few cases and of course it would be nice to extend it to to other interpretations or the formulations but I didn't do that uh, uh, I, but if you're interested in the article, there are a few notes on Bonian mechanics, a foot, there are a few footnotes. Because Bonian mechanics uh, fixes the positions of, it's, it's like, it's as if uh, a preferred observable was fixed at the theory level. Not even at the level of uh, models, but even uh, at the theory level, the position uh, measurements. Uh, so this this would yeah so this would uh, I think it corresponds to, it, it, there's a way of uh, interpreting it uh, with my approach and for the Eisenberg picture I haven't thought about it but it's uh, it's uh, it's an interesting uh, question so uh, I will I will think about it. <laughs> Uh, it would require analysis, analysis and uh, I couldn't do it like right now, but uh, uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Thank you. But uh, in general, um, would you say that uh, would, would you say that there, there could be um, like middle cases between the two you are presented? 
because you Sorry? presented the extreme cases where either all observables are fixed and all initial conditions are not, or the other way around, but in principle, they could have been uh, middle cases or not. Uh, well, some reviewers, well, they are, it's quite complex. Some reviewers uh, told me that in some theories, in some uh, models, the initial conditions are fixed but the Hamiltonian of the system is not fixed. So it's more, it's a bit more complex than what I've presented. Uh, it's of course in scattering theories. Uh, so you have this kind of models where boundary conditions and initial condition in the far past are fixed, but the Hamiltonian remains uh, variable. So it's, it's a bit more complicated and uh, it's, it would require more final analysis too. I mean, a case by case basis. Okay, uh, thank you for your advice. Uh, we have a question from Peter Verde. So, Peter, please ask it. Yes, thanks. Uh, hi, thanks a lot for this great talk. Found very uh, interesting and inspiring. But I have a question for clarification. Uh, could you show your slides again and go back to the next to last slide? I think the one of these three points there. You say, so it makes more sense to fix observables and let initial conditions vary for explanatory purposes. Um, and I don't really see how that follows from uh, uh, the, the first and the second points. So could you just uh, uh, reformulate well, the, okay. the argument? So, a bit? so the idea that if we want to use a model uh, a scientific model to produce an explanation for some phenomena, then I think it would make more sense in the case of quantum mechanics to fix the observables in the model. Because when we provide an explanation in general, we're interested in uh, particular properties. And so we don't need to keep the observable variable. So the the example I gave is the explanation of spectrum of the emission and uh, absorption spectrum of atoms from the model of atoms. So the, roughly the explanation is that uh, electrons can go from one energy state to another. And when they do so, they emit, uh, they emit uh, photons and the frequency of photons correspond to the difference in energy state. So you have a model with all the possible energy states and the transitions between uh, energy states produce uh, spectral rays. Uh, but in this case, the observable is fixed, is implicitly fixed by the, for the explanatory purpose. We're interested in, in uh, energy, in the energy state of the electron and not at all in its position. And, but for the, Another, another aspect. So this is a sensitivity. This is a second point, sensitivity to mm -hmm. properties of interest. And the first point is that in general, when uh, explanations are, are often analyzed in counterfactual terms. So, and counter, the counterfactual generally works on uh, something that is similar to initial conditions. So if I want to say, to explain a fire, I would say there was a spark if there hadn't been this part, there wouldn't be a fire. So mm -hmm. I have a, like a counterfactual on initial conditions, the spark, a spark or no spark, which produce fire or no fire. And, uh, and so it makes more sense if we want to use a model to explain, it makes more sense to have all the possible uh, initial conditions represented within the model. I see a bit better now, uh, but the Woodward aspect is just that it's counterfactual or also the interventionist aspect of it. And I still mm -hmm. don't see why the causal, um, why the word uh, causal terms is there. Well, well, you can just keep uh, the counterfactual if you want. Uh, causal is just, it's just that, uh, it suggests that the models of consistent histories can be interpreted. I think they can be naturally interpreted as being causal, if not for the perspective of aspect, which clashes with the usual ways of conceiving of causality. But, uh, but 
but uh, it's like uh, it's like a well-behaved probabilistic uh, structure of transitions of local and it's lo all local and so on so it's quite easy to have a counterfactual analysis of causation in this case but and and then uh, some people say that uh, explanations are causal, that explaining something is giving a cause for a phenomenon. So again, it would be, it would make sense. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for this discussion. Uh, now we have to finish. So uh, uh, thanks to both our speakers. Uh, thanks to all the persons who were uh, in the public and uh, ask questions or just listening. Uh, 